Many thanks for choosing us. We begin with five Ghanaian nationals who are demanding the prosecution of three soldiers who they say assaulted them over allegations they had stolen a laptop. They have sued government at the ECOWAS Court of Justice, alleging human rights violations. They are boys who range between the ages of 13 to 16 years when the alleged violations occurred in June 2018. The mother of one of the boys is also part of this action, bringing the number of those behind this action to five. They say they were woken up from their sleep and picked up from their respective houses by some soldiers of the Ghana Armed Forces stationed at the Liberian Barracks, Liberation Barracks in Sonyai. Their story was told in Joy News' documentary, As If We Weren't Human, tracking on solved police and military brutalities. Listen to how they recounted their ordeal. On June 24, 2018, four children in Sunyai were brutalized by the military for allegedly stealing a computer. The children said although they maintained their innocence, they were tortured to confess to a crime they did not commit. <laughs> Kwesi, a name I altered to protect his identity, is emotional. Recollecting treatment meted out to him is painful. Okay. Okay. Ghana's Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice in December 2019 asked the three soldiers accused of brutalizing the four minors to pay compensation to the victims. The soldiers were also to face disciplinary action from the Ghana Armed Forces. Parents of the four boys say they have since received the 10,000 cities each from the military. They however claim that none of the soldiers responsible 
for this incident has been prosecuted. Still on issues of abuse here in Ghana, a businessman, Victor Apreko, is alleging that his home was raided by armed men wearing what looked like military uniforms on September 22. He has since reported the matter to the police. There's more in the following report. The pain from the events of September 22 is still fresh in his mind. Suddenly, before I would see, a, a man came into the room. I don't know where he's from. I don't have any, I don't know him. I don't have any contact with him. Before I would see, he has jumped the house wall with this kind of metals on the wall and come to the door. But then I've opened the door uh, the main door to the hall a little bit so that I can be going out and in and out. Before I would see he has jumped the wall, opened that door and he was standing in the wall, uh, in the hall. So I was like, eh, who are you? Then suddenly, before I was, uh, then he came and hooked me, began to beat me, he was wearing military dress. Began to beat me, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, uh, I have to pay rent. I said, what rent? However, says he does not owe the landlord. In a court. Because, one, there was no case of emergency that military should jump a wall, a high wall, and enter the house, break the door, and enter, and come and beat me and arrest me. They don't have that right. And if yes, what have I done? For a military to come into them to the house. Three, they were allowed by the investigator who is investigating the case. Because when I went there, the first question he asked the military people was that where is the suspect? So it means he knew that that's what they are coming to do in the house and he allowed them. And he has also refused to ask it. It should be record their name immediately that they brought me to the police station so that it's official. He has refused also to do that. So I question him that I want to know the, the names of the military who arrested me from house forcefully and brought me to the police station. He has refused to give me that. Let's move on to some education because education policy think tank Africa Education Watch says they've identified a syndicate trading exam questions for cash using social media platforms. The findings were launched in Accra today and captures how the syndicates creatively target OWASI candidates and supply them with questions and in some cases answer uh, many answers many hours before the examination. Exam ag uh, administrators Wayek in recent reaction to news of such leakages have defended their systems and reported issues where compromises were confirmed to police. Well, Africa Education Watch says the problem is bigger than earlier thought with highly organized groups targeting candidates. Executive Director Kofi Asari has, has just joined me in the studio for this conversation. Good to see you. Kofi, not uh, so long ago you were here to talk about issues affecting education. Now, this issue of leakages has been on the table for a while. And the last time you raised it, Wayek came to defend it. What has your report or mo your monitoring revealed this time around? Well, our monitoring report from 50 schools and 30 different Telegram and WhatsApp platforms on which questions were sold for between... 30 cities to 150 cities reveals that the questions market is, is actually a brisk business. It's a multi-million um, CD business where question marketers get questions. According to them, they get them from the printing um, press of work, and then they sell the questions to students and whoever is ready to pay through mobile money and buy them. Mm. So our team apart from monitoring the conduct of students on the ground, yeah. was also involved in the monitoring of the sales and marketing of questions on Telegram platforms and on WhatsApp platforms. Mm. And indeed, 
we paid for um, about 14 quest um, papers, 14 papers on this on three different platforms. And um, out of the questions that we paid for, a significant of them were delivered. Indeed, out of 20 papers monitored, 55% of the questions were delivered to us in good time. Okay. Questions were delivered between 106 hours to one hour before the examination. I'm okay. talking about five days, between five days to the paper, okay. and then one hour to the start of the paper. Mm. This is significant because WIAC has always maintained that questions were only circulating from schools, from examination centers, when, whenever the question pack was opened. Mm. That is not true. Okay. It is not true because close to midnight, before midnight, around 11 o'clock, when we got the questions for elective mathematics, no center could have been operating at that time. Okay. And that, so we, 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 we see that repeatedly shifting, I mean, denying that questions are not leaking at, at dawn or are not leaking days before the papers is only an act to escape blame or responsibility and okay. push responsibility to the teachers mm. or to the schools and also water down on a situation that is much, 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 much bigger than we've been made to believe. Mm. So earlier, the suspect, the suspicion was between the police and those who were going to um, circulate the news, um, the exams papers. But now, uh, you're you're suggesting that it could be coming from Wayek itself. The questions are not leaking from the schools. Okay. What is happening in the schools is that some schools have WhatsApp platforms where immediately the question packs are opened. Teachers on standby solve the questions, mm -hmm. put them on WhatsApp platforms, and students have their phones inside and they're copying. Oh, wow. Okay. In the exams hall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And in YX, it went on the 15th of September. I will give it to YX. They admitted that they have seen that. Okay. That is what YX, in their, in their own words, called institutionalized cheating, involving mm. everyone involved, including the YX officer. Mm. Okay. But if you want to diagnose the issue of examination questions leakage, yep. and you listen to that rendition, you'll be tempted to believe that by curbing that menace at the examination hall level, you'll solve the problem. But okay. you won't solve the problem because the questions are leaking days okay. before the, 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 the actual paper and not minutes before the actual paper. Okay. So that, that particular chapter is a defensive one just to escape blame. Mm. But we are not interested in escaping blame or apportioning blame. We are interested in finding out where questions are leaking. Okay. On the basis that if you don't understand where the questions are leaking from, you cannot profess solutions, operational, administrative, policy solutions to the issue. You, you'll be doing a wrongful diagnosis of the, of the situation. Mm. That's why we are saying that for this research we conducted in 2020 WASI, Questions are not leaking from the schools. They are leaking at a time that questions are fully in the custody of WIAC at the examination depots. But our conversation with the, the people running most of these platforms, these WhatsApp platforms and Telegram platforms, suggest that they have been getting their questions from the printing houses. Mm. And these printing houses are printing houses run by WIAC themselves. Mm. So the, the last time, uh, WIAC also admitted that there were some exams, more practices in some schools, and they were going to investigate. Um, what has happened to that, do you know? Yes, we know. We met WIAC and Parliament and the GES and the Ministry of Education two weeks ago to present our report to them. Mm. And WIAC corroborated 90% of our findings, wow. including WIAC themselves identifying schools where teachers were teaching on blackboards the entire candidates in the examination. So the examination hall was just like a classroom session where the teacher was teaching. Wow. Yes. And WIAC provided the evidence. That's what they, what they also saw. I said, okay, good. Because we also saw similar things, including videos of schools where cheating was actually supervised by the school authorities, including the security men external invigilators from WIAC and the school authorities. Quite interesting. So we, I think that we have spent too much time on whether they are leakages or not. Now I think we should agree that The system that lacks integrity. The system lacks credibility. And so we must begin to have discussions around a systemic solution to this challenge mm. and not ad hoc solutions. Okay. Systemic, we need the Ministry of Education at this point will have to be seriously in developing a roadmap 
for a systemic reform, mm. a holistic reform of mm. the assessment sector. But, but that's why. I can. But even as before you talk about these reforms and your recommendations, did WIAC tell you how they handle these issues that we've mentioned? In the meeting with um, the, the, the parliament and the stakeholders, including Charles and everyone, they indicated that they were going to prosecute the, them. And um, we are of the view that beyond prosecution, we need to name and shame some of these people. Mm -hmm. Because if people realize that if you engage in such acts and you are caught, you will be first shamed. You know, that one alone will serve as much more deterrent to them than the prosecution. Because when it comes to the prosecution, I, I, I can bet on you that when it comes to matters of evidence, you, 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 you may end up leaving most of them. That's mm -hmm. why the, 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 in all the prosecutions that AG or the police have been doing for YEC, mm. the success rate, the conviction rate is very low. It's okay. a single digit. Yeah, but, but interestingly, you, you also went to the police to report this matter of leakages and you asked for investigations by the police. What has come of that? Well, we submitted a first petition to the Data General CID about five weeks ago. And after 10 days, we went and then provided a second batch of information uh, to augment the first one to assist the police in do the investigation. Our follow-up with the police indicates that the matter has been forwarded to the cyber crime unit and then they are investigating the matter, um, still working on it. Um, while we have absolute confidence, we have absolute confidence in the ability and the credibility of the police to, to, uh, to deal decisively with the matter, mm. the police action will, will end up getting people who were responsible for selling questions, right? Okay. Okay. But that will not solve the question. The okay. Because the problem is that if there are no leaks, there won't be any product to sell. To sell. These guys are hosting. Okay, so they we need to it get from, it from the root. Exactly. And that could be from Wayek itself. Exactly. And Wayek it itself admits that, that in times past that people have been caught selling questions. Mm -hmm. They have never disclosed their source at Wayek. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it means that Prosecution is good. It deters others from you know, participating in the same enterprise tomorrow. But it is not part of the sustainable solution. The sustainable solution are efforts that are aimed at identifying the exact source of leakage, whether mm. it is happening at the printing house, at the point where questions are packed, at the point where questions are transported from Accra to the depots or at the depots, mm. right? it's not in the schools. Okay, so in, in trying to resolve this whole issue, which you say shouldn't be just prosecution, but digging deep to find the root causes, I'm sure there's also in there the question about what could be accounting for this? Why do students want to copy? Why do people want to get exams questions. Elsewhere, you don't hear this kind of story. What could be accounting for this? And addressing that could be a solution to what we are fighting right now. Exactly. Exactly. That is correct. In our recommendations, apart from the policy level recommendations, we appreciate that there are sociological factors. There are behavioral factors that need to change. The first contributory factor from the demand side of the equation is the high stakes nature of our examination system our external examination system or our summative examination system. Mm. If you don't get A1 to C6 in Ghana, you are virtually seen as useless mm. because you cannot progress in any way along your career path. Okay. That is how the system has been designed. Mm. Someone gets C7 and is able to go to university in Australia or US. Okay. But if you don't get between A1 and C6, you are done. Mm. Okay. So because of that, that was C examination is high stakes. The stakes are high that I will not invest in my child's education from kindergarten one, and only after 14 years be told that he has failed. Mm -hmm. So at any cost, you have to pass. So is there a problem with our education structure? The problem is with the assessment structure. Okay. This assessment structure we are running is a colonial one, mm. which is based on testing one's cognitive abilities. Okay. It, 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 it does not test your your aptitudes. Mm. It, tells, it tests only your cognitive ability. Okay. So it is mainly based on recall. Why examinations are mainly based on recall. They are hardly applied. They are hardly applied. And so if you are testing someone based on their cognitive abilities alone, you are doing restrictive testing. The person, yes, the person had failed because he couldn't solve a quadratic equation. Yes. But what else does the person know? Okay. What is the person's strength? What else, how useful again can the person be? Mm. 
be interested in testing their aptitude, not just cognitive development. Okay. So this system is actually um, old-fashioned. If you okay. go to countries like Finland, they are doing 100% participatory um, assessments. They are not doing tests. Okay. If you go to Scotland and other countries, they are doing 50-50 mm. class work. I'm not talking about class exam. Okay. Class project work, okay. participation in class, mm -hmm. even your behavior and attitude. And so all that comes together involves 50. a lot more practical that is 50. than actually doing this. Uh, exactly. 50. Then mm -hmm. the remaining 50 will go for the exam. Okay. So it, the, the, the stress involved in the high stake examination is reduced mm -hmm. because 50 of your marks is obtained from the school. Yeah. So if you are in a school where you are doing 50 assessments, your teacher is undertaking teacher based assessments. So you are going to take your classes seriously. Yep. You are not going to use mobile phones on campus because you know your teacher is determined among that there's 50% of your results. Okay. But where it is 30, 70, even the person who taught has limited control okay. over assessing what they taught you. Mm. So that is one reason. The mm. second reason is the high cost of remedial schooling. Okay. Apart from last year, up to 40%, up to 60% of WASI candidates were always having at least failure in one of the core subjects, mm -hmm. which meant that 60% of candidates were always remedial candidates. Mm -hmm. I hope you are getting me. Yeah. It was only last year that 50% had passes in all the four core. But even for last year, mm -hmm. 50%. It means that about 200,000 students mm -hmm. are remedial candidates because okay. they have to rewrite one mm -hmm. once you get more than C6. If you want to do two subjects at Action, you, uh, sorry, at a school like I do college, you'll be spending about, about 5,000 cities, 6,000 cities a year mm -hmm. for the year mm -hmm. just to write two subjects, two subjects. including feeding and accommodation. Mm -hmm. In rural areas where learning outcomes are very poor, students who fail examination have to come to Accra and yeah. Kumasi and pay high costs for their children the to go to remedial education. Now, that 6,000 you'll be paying for remedial schooling is the same, it's, it's, it's more than the amount that government pays for your free senior high school for the entire three years. Yeah. So, so teach, not teachers, but parents and students in a bid to avoid the cost of remedial schooling, mm. invest among others in negative ways, buy questions, buy phones for their students and for their children, and encourage them to do anything possible to pass. That is why the teachers, when we met Parliament, Chas was saying, mm. and indeed they, 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 didn't, they didn't say it because we know, that immediate, there's no, it's, it's, virtual, it's difficult to, to, to identify a student in Ghana here that doesn't own a phone. Maybe unless minus Wesley girls and then St. Louis. It is difficult. Okay. What happens is that if you seize a, a student's phone today, the next day they have another one. Okay. They have backups. Mm. Yes. And so you should know that the amount of investment going into buying phones, especially in final year, are not investment that the child themselves, the, ch the children themselves can find. Okay. There is a backing from, from whom. From the parents. That's why I'm, I, I, we see that. Mm the high cost of remedial education is a contributory factor. Okay. Now, these are the demand side, the factors that lead students to demand for this question. The supply side is that there's, a, there's an opportunity in YX system. Okay. There's an opportunity in YX question security system. Mm -hmm. And people are taking advantage of it to do business. Of course. So definitely um, looking at the uh, assessment structure, that could be a long-term uh, uh, something that we need to improve. But in the interim, and I'm happy you mentioned that if there's no questions or if there's no something uh, for somebody to sell there will be nothing for, be for, for them to sell yeah. and the students will take their work seriously exactly. and will not go and look for phones to back up so exactly. um, in your report what were the recommendations to deal with some of these challenges we, we have recommended first that the ministry of education must institute an independent probe a surgical knife inquiry into the source of this year's examination mm. syndication. Okay. It shouldn't be left to pass under the bridge as, 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 as usual. Mm. Something different has happened this year. The second thing is that the Ministry of Education must come out with a clear road plan through a consultative process with stakeholders. Now, this sorry, roadmap, this roadmap must, must, must indicate the ministry's intention, plans, and strategies to overhaul the assessment system. Mm. Note that we are not only intercepting WASI questions. Okay. We are intercepting questions from NAPTEX and the Okay. Social studies and English, we intercepted them okay. from this same question. So it means that it is not a WAIC issue. Okay. It is an issue within the assessment system, which is about questions integrity, okay. question security. So the ministry must come up with a comprehensive roadmap through consultative processes with stakeholders. Okay. 
about how it intends to decisively and holistically reform the assessment sector. It mm. is not just a matter of just saying that we are going to, we are going to introduce serialization of questions. That is an ad hoc solution. Mm -hmm. It is a good solution, but an ad hoc one. It is not systemic, and mm -hmm. it will not survive the, the system because the system is leaky, the system lacks integrity, and so anything you build on it will not survive. Yeah. The, third is, the third thing is that moral society, religious bodies, traditional authorities. So at the launch today, the teaching man was represented. Mm -hmm. the religious bodies, all the religious bodies were, were represented. Parents were represented. We need to launch a national campaign against examination of practices, targeting the attitudes of students. Students now believe that they have the entitlement to cheat. <laughs> to the extent that when, the, when, a, when, when an academic headmaster of a to senior high school prevented students from cheating, immediately after the examination, they destroyed his plantain farm. <laughs> when, students, when, when students at Ninahini Senior High School were not allowed to do the normal, Mm. in an examination, immediately the examination ended. They eventually their whole dormitory down. So the, entit the, 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 ent the, the entitlement to cheat syndrome mm. mindset mm. must change. Yeah. And it will take a lot of process because it seems our students are learning about corruption in school yeah. instead of what they went to school to learn. Yeah. It will take a, 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 a holistic um, effort from the clergy, from the cathedral, from our mosques, through to our homes, and then to our schools. Mm. Everybody must be involved in this national campaign. So we have thrown it to the moral society stakeholders that it is time for us to initiate strategies that will change the moral psyche of our students. Because pr at present, the norm for senior high school students is that once I'm going to school, I need to get questions. Mm. I need to have a phone, okay. plug it on Telegram, buy mm. my questions and mm. pass. That is not an exception. Okay. It is now a norm. And so people are being assessed on different levels. One group of students have full knowledge of the questions. Mm. The others are genuinely hardworking students who are learning mm. passing. You cannot assess students on such an um, inequal or unfair basis and mm. expect any stakeholder, mm. internally or externally, to call such a system mm. credible. And, and indeed, we've, we've um, spoken with WAIEC, uh, which is center in this whole thing, and it says it is studying your report and it will uh, speak on it later. But again, what's the plan for implementation beyond the launch? Because you've made a lot of recommendations that will help um, uh, resolve the issues that we are dealing with. But I mean, submitting the report to Ministry of Education, all the stakeholders, doesn't really solve the problem. Implementation of those recommendations will. How do you intend to push for that? We are engaging a lot of stakeholders. As I mentioned, we've already met with Parliament. We've met with the headmasters, we've met with WIAC, we've met with the GES, the Minister of Education at one forum. And we presented our recommendations to them. Most of the members of Parliament made input into our recommendations. And we're happy that Parliament was interested in also contributing to strengthening accountability and the relevance and credibility of our mm. future share assessment system. Okay. We are, what we are doing from the launch is that we are going to have we are going to begin having one-on-one -on -one meetings, especially with the ministry. Look, all we are discussing is about the Ministry of Education. Okay. Last year, when the leakages occurred, teacher unions made noise, everybody was making noise. The ministry never heard about the noise. Okay. They never heard about the noise. But immediately the results were released. They were the first to publish in the graphic that we've had the highest WASI score. Mm -hmm. The inertia is our issue. The only agency that can initiate these reforms is the ministry. Mm. So we are going to start having one-on-one -on -one discussions with the Ministry of Education. We are happy that the minister has made comments that indicate that government is ready to reform the system and strengthen mm. it. Mm. But we are at variance in respect of the approach because the ministry believes that bringing serialization of questions will solve the matter. And we believe that you can't just bring serialization of questions and solve any matter because questions will still leak. Just that the possibility of the one leaking getting to me, uh, being the one I'm going to write is, is what will reduce. But we want to build a system that has integrity. Okay. There should not be any leakage of questions in Ghana. Mm. And that shouldn't be impossible. And um, thankfully, uh, we are joined by Kwesi Kwaten, who is spokesperson for the Education Ministry. I mean, your ministry has a lot to do with regards to some of the issues that have been discussed here. First of all, I want to find out from you, have you seen that report, the Education Monitoring uh, Report, uh, which identifies that there's a syndicate trading exam questions for cash? 
All right, so we've lost uh, Chrissy Quad Singh there. So, yeah, so, so, uh, so he, uh, we'll try and get him back because he has to answer some of so the questions. So it's only for the us. ministry that can initiate the reforms. And so all we, all we hope to do is that we hope to ride on the back of the political will that we, um, we have secured from this government to do something about what has been there since, according to some of them, we started selling the questions on, on Telegram since 2013. Okay. So what has been there and hasn't been resolved or hasn't been attended to because it benefits some people since 2013. Mm -hmm. If the will to do something about it is there, we can only capitalize on that will and demand for even more or far-reaching holistic reforms that would reform the system and not just an aspect of the system mm. so that we can be assured that we are, we are dealing with this problem decisively once and for all. Mm. We are digitizing questions transmission from Wayek to mm. the schools mm. and cutting out all the human element involvement. All the human elements involved. Kwesi Kwating has joined us back. He's a spokesperson for the Education Ministry. My question was uh, whether you've seen this document, the report from uh, EduWatch monitoring uh, of the exams and the uh, revelations of that there's been a syndicate a trading exam questions for cash. Hello, Aisha. Yes, Kwesi Kwating. Can you respectfully repeat your question? Okay, so I'm asking if you've seen that report by EduWatch, the, re the monitoring report, and it has cited a lot of malpractices and um, exam leakages, uh, question leakages in the exams. And it's also identified that there is a syndicate that is trading exam questions. So where do they get the questions from and all of that in that report? Have you seen that report? Okay, a very good afternoon to you once again, uh, Aisha, and uh, to my brother Kofi and all your, your viewers and listeners. Uh, apparently, your producers just sent me the report, but I think I generally... Uh, for me, is a conversation about uh, exam leakages and then largely how, as a country or as a people, as a ministry, uh, we are able to, 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 at the end of the day, have a more robust system so that we'll be able to deal with some of these challenges that keep occurring every year. Of course, I mean, we do admit, and if you listen to the Minister of Education, at every level, at all points, he's made an admission that this problem has been with us. And uh, I, will, I mean, describe the problem as even a systematic one or a systemic problem where it predates even back, uh, even before uh, Wasi came into being or Waiye came into being. And so generally we have that problem. And of course, I mean, if you look at uh, some of the reasons that has been ascribed to it, I mean, my brother Kofi on, on even several pl platforms has agreed with me that as a country, we, are, we overly focus us on, on training our students just to go and write exams. And so it's a more reason why in the long term we are looking at uh, training students that will be assertive, that will be problem solvers, that will not necessarily focus on, 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 on just be, being trained to go and write exams, but they will be trained to fix problems. And that's, I mean, that's where the, the minister's drive comes in. And of course, the president's education transformation agenda. But that is in the long term. But of course, in the short term, we are looking at also, I mean, closing all the bottlenecks that are associated with, with, with this whole issue about exam leakage. But Aisha, before I proceed, I think we have to also get some distinction clear here. If you look at, um, we are not, that is not in a way to suggest that there are, there are some of the instances or some of the cases that we hear about exam leakages are not entirely genuine. But most of the times, uh, we have to separate issues of leakages uh, probably even for more practices. Because sometimes a student gets into the exam so and probably is able to sneak a phone inside the exam so and say, take a picture of his exam papers. And I mean, certainly it's a more practice. And you see such a question on the, on, on the internet. Of course, I mean, today, certainly, as soon as you put something on social media, it just travels viral. Mm. When you see such a question, even though the students are in the exam room writing this, that very same paper, it is seen as probably a leakage or it is construed as a leakage. I think that should be separated or that act of more practice should probably be separated from, 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 from the real leakage problem that we have. Again, there is also another, another leg of the problem where you have rogue individuals, like Kofi mentioned, a syndicate. Because, I mean, it's a syndicate clearly because, I mean, Wayek is supposed to be in charge of the questions. Wayek doesn't work with them in a vacuum. They work with human beings. Mm. They don't work with robots. They work with human beings. You have the security. You have GS officials. You have a whole lot of people in, in that 
examination conducting chain. So, so the question is how then do this leak? But you see, the the, the problem goes beyond just uh, just uh, how do you call it being very simplistic. I have always said, and the Minister of Education have always insisted that every activity that you have a lot of human interface in that activity, you are likely to have some of these problems. I mean, it is a more reason why recently, I mean, Kofu was there, in Kofu Udiya, Kofu was there, myself, were there. We met the Parliamentary Select Committee on Education uh, together with the Ministry of Education, the Honorable Minister, the Deputy Honorable Minister of Education, uh, Reverend Tim Pojo, was also there. All of us collectively, together with other stakeholders like Wayek, finding a long-lasting solution to it. And so the proposal that, of course, came was serialization, which means that, I mean, if we set questions, we can probably have about... 20 set of different questions in one particular room mm. so that the incentive, the drive to even leave the, leak the questions will, will, will not be because at the end of the day, if one leaks, nobody knows that that is the one that he is going to write. He's but but sure. Again, see, there's, a, there's, there's a bigger issue with the uh, structure, assessment structure, which actually is paving the way for people to uh, want to cheat and buy exam questions so that they can pass the examination. Now, is there a roadmap uh, to reform the external assessment sector so that we can have a finality to this? Yes. So, so Aisha, the, the, yes. I mean, the problem even goes beyond assessment uh, because at the end of the day, any form of assessment, if you have, you see, the human mind is, is, is naturally organically negatively biased to the extent that if you provide the right environment, right circumstance, uh, everything right for the person to indulge in anything that uh, satisfies the person, especially when the person compromises, then certainly the person is likely to throw in that direction. And so for me, it even goes beyond that. Because at the end of the day, whatever assessment system, whether it's a physical assessment, it's a oral assessment, it's a racial assessment, you will still have people compromising it. So what you do is to put systems that are in place, or you put systems in place that will, 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 will demotivate or uninspired situations where people will, will, will even want to eat. And what's Again, the system that the education ministry course, intends to put are, in place? Of course, we are we are engaging we are engaging Wayek. I mean, we've started a conversation about serialization. We are also looking at in the long term. I mean, doing something like electronic uh, electronic uh, uh, how do you call it testing? Where where uh, just like we we we've, we've had in other countries where you you log on beside your computer you are biometrically verified the computer is scanning you as you write your exams as soon as probably you turn your neck to a certain radius uh, maybe beyond a certain radius the exams cut by default they are system that is monitoring that is in the long term what we should be we should be looking at in mm. the short term i mean serialization has, 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 has come out stronger but, but the, the question is the question is crazy will the serialization and the leakage so, you see, the whole point is about, like I said, I said the premise very properly, that the premise is about trying to reduce the human interface. And you use the model that probably is closer to curing the problem. Of course, every model that you use may have its own challenges. If you want to debate whatever model that anybody or any other person will bring up. But, you see, if you look at other countries, I mean, not, we shouldn't even go far. Let's even go into our investment. When I was in the university, I remember we wrote an exam to a paper and all the questions were serialized. There were about 10 different sets of questions. And so when you turn your left, you do not know the question, the, the question that somebody is having. Mm. But of course, these questions are set within the context of the, of the, of the same syllables that we are using. Mm. And so we believe that in the short term, even if it's not able to cure the entire, entire problem, certainly it's going to reduce. But I mean, Asha, you asked a very important question about also, the, the how we are, we, are, we are trying to reduce this whole, whole, whole uh, how do you call it, training students to just be exams oriented. If you look at the new curriculum that has been implemented from the standard base one, which has been implemented, of course, I mean, when you look at the common core one at the JHS level, which is also be, be implemented, you, you, you see that it removes that element of examination. Of course, I mean, it doesn't also mean that the national standardization text will not come off. It will come off and it's coming off. But that element of overly training or training students to be overly reliant on, 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 on just going to write exams without being assertive, without being critical thinkers, without being problem solvers, especially in this form of industrial revolution. I mean, it is something that, I mean, if you look at the reforms that the Honorable Minister of Education, Dr. Aladitum, has, has initiated, these are all carrying some of the, of the problems that we've inherited and is been with us for some time now. So for me, I mean, we come to Ghanaians to admit that, yes, 
I mean, we have a problem. We have a problem in our whole educational landscape. That is the, the whole reason why we have always been saying that we have to reimagine. We have to rethink, rethink how we do our exams. We have to re look at how, how exams is conducted in this country. We have to re look at how we are training our students so that at the end of the day, are we training them to be exams oriented or to be problem solvers? I mean, these are all conversations that we are having. These are all uh, 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 issues that we are addressing as a ministry. Of course, it's not going to end in one day, but we are very optimistic that, of course, under the leadership of the able minister, Honorable Dr. Ayose Edwitu, we should be able to make strides at the end of the day. I'm grateful for your time. Kwesi Kwating, right. spokesperson for the Education Ministry. Now, you've heard the Ministry of Education, and they say they are aware of the problems, but they are taking it one after the other. I mean, do we have that patience? I don't think we are in a rush at all. Um, as I mentioned, we appreciate that we have some political will to build the momentum and initiate far-reaching systemic reforms. The minister, and I've discussed this issue several with the minister, and he believes that serialization is one of the short-term measures that can be taken. I agree with him that serialization can only work within the short term, something we can just start even at BEC next month. Mm. Okay. But the challenge we are discussing is a systemic one. Ad hoc solutions will not will not survive, okay. will not be sustainable. Mm. We are here because we have failed to appreciate that this system requires a holistic reform uh, uh, solution because this is a systemic issue. So what we are saying is that while it is important for us to immediately start serializing questions, we need to have a roadmap, a broad reform strategy for the assessment sector because serialization will not make WAEC accountable. Mm. Serialization will not change the situation where WAEC is the referee, the coach, and the player. Serialization will not bring a regulator to set standards for WAEC, enforce standards, sanction um, non-compliance to standards. Mm. Serialization will not stop the leakage. Okay, so the challenges we are, we are, we are discussing will not be solved through serialization. But serialization will help in the short term as a stopgap measure to try and make it difficult for questions that leak to be easily accessible to students by way of whether or not what I buy is what will come. But the system is still designed on leaky foundations. It lacks systemic integrity, and this systemic deficit will have to be solved by reducing or removing the human element involvement in questions transmission. Mm. If you do that and you add serialization, then you are going to have a near perfect system that mm. has integrity. Mm. So as we are having discussions about serialization in the immediate term, I think that the ground is fertile for us to do broad stakeholder consultation that should lead to the development of a, room, a roadmap to reform the entire assessment sector so mm. that we are not just serializing, we are building institutions that will hold WAEC accountable directly, that will mm -hmm. regulate WAEC, set standards, not only for WAEC, mm -hmm. because we are seeing NAPTEC questions, it's exactly. not WAEC. Yep. So that the assessment sector at the potential level will now be regulated. Mm. Then we are going to have situations where within the assessment sector, the reform that we are, we are, we are craving for, moving more of the assessment to the school level than the test-based you know, a mm. summative uh, mm. process at mm. the end of the day. And, and that's where the Cambridge uh, part comes in. And I'm happy that he spoke about the new curriculum and all of that. Let's speak with Timothy Mensa. He's a retired teacher. He thought uh, Cambridge curriculum 20 years, and he joins us with some experiences. Timothy, I'm grateful that you're able to join this conversation. I need you to actually paint a picture of how that curriculum looks and to what extent that can resolve our exam leakages. I mean, in Ghana. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to add up to my mm. learned friend over there, the gentleman over there. Um, what happens is that we are looking at it in totality. But the problem is, let me take it, uh, it's going to be my problem is too with Wyatt. You won't pass questions together with schemes together with exams, um, the chief exam um, report, you will not get them. That is number one. Because as a teacher, I need these things to help me to focus, I mean, to be on track based on what they are looking for. And the students must also have access to it. 
That is number one. Number two, imagine you are writing three papers in a day. Geography one, geography two, geography three. Unbelievable. How is a student going to cope with this? With a curriculum, with a CIE curriculum, you can write a paper, and then you have about five or two weeks gap to write the second paper, and about another one week gap to write the third paper. Yep. So should you not do well in the first one? You know you have the chance to work harder to improve on the other one. Mm. But with the one that we are saying with Wyatt, they are writing everything on that day. And the, if you look at the extent of the syllabus, it's huge. How would the student be able, as the, as the gentleman over there said, how is the student will be able to learn everything, cognitive? How is he going to produce mm. it? Mm. The student will want to fall on um, some of these things to cheat. Mm. And that is what I'm saying. So I agree with him. We should look at it in totality. Mm. With the period that you have taught this Cambridge curriculum, have you yes. seen um, exam leakages just like we're seeing with our system? Not, not really. You, you may sometimes hear that this, even when you hear something like that, they write in, in different areas. But the problem is that they have some zones, about three zones. They write without leakages. And that is what is baffling me. Having seen it since we started, like they will say, hey, something has leaked in the school and students are looking for it. Mm. I haven't. And that, that, is my, that is my worry. So I agree with the gentleman over there that we should look at it in totality. If, if, if you don't help the students, in fact, they write mock and they realize that they don't do well. You tell them what to do. You have past questions online. You have examination reports online. You have the scheme online. Within one month, you see the change. Mm. When you go to, you walk to work. I have gone there personally to look for past questions, to look for scheme, and you will not get them. Okay. So at the end of the day, they don't build the confidence, and they want to resort to cheating. Mm. That is my contribution. All right. I'm Thank grateful for uh, this experience you've shared with us. So, Simo Chimensa is a retired teacher. And, of course, he's painting exactly or speaking the same language you are speaking. Yeah, the stress, the stress levels are high. There are some papers that, between preparing and part two, you don't go out. Mm -hmm. For, like, elective mass. You go and sit for the written. And then, immediately you finish, you are continuing with the objective. So, it all comes back to the assessment structure. We yeah. need to do something. You understand why we need about to have that. a holistic view about it. Uh, done and had, had, had mm -hmm. to exactly. But in your meeting with the Ministry of Education, and uh, did you go to Parliament? Did you submit a report to Parliament? Yes. yes. What has been the assurances so far with uh, these revelations? There is a commitment to. There is there is a commit. Parliament has indicated that it's ready to support WIAC to review the WIAC law. Again. The reason why WIAC has no regulation is because they are not set up to be regulated. They are set up as a sub regional body, okay. okay, not a Ghana, Ghana body. So if you want to regulate WIAC in Ghana, it's difficult because there are five other countries, four other countries involved. Which is part of WIAC. Uh, so we have indicated that, look, we need to have standards and have external agencies enforce those standards. Okay. And the only way you can get that is to amend their law and then subject them to this regulation. So if it will entail us dealing with only WIAC Ghana, fine, because we cannot, in the name of sub-regional agencies, compromise the quality of our enviable educational system. Yeah. You know? mm. So yes, I, I see initiatives being made to review the WIAC law, and then we are, we are going to participate in that process, whether, um, I mean, we are going to participate in that process. Apart from that also, I see, um, but you see, let's not, let's not be too optimistic about Parliament. Parliament has the commitment, yeah. and I respect the commitment and the, the, the commitment of his um, honorable um, Isiama, mm -hmm. the committee chairperson. Yeah. But 99% of reforming the assessment system, mm. regulating WIAC, mm. demanding accountability from WIAC, mm. people whose job it is to ensure that questions do not leak, yeah. being punished for not doing their work well or sleeping on the job, mm. prosecuting offenders, mm -hmm. All these actions, the only institution that has the mandate to ensure that they are done is the Ministry, ministry of, of Education. education yeah. That is why we have said that the ministry 
must come out with a clear plan mm. on how it intends to reform the system, mm. not not just this realization. Mm. It is good to realize, yeah. but the foundation is leaky. Mm. If you build any structure on it, it will crumble. Yeah. So let's look at the entire system holistically. The way government has taken its time for the past four years mm. and is reforming the education system holistically, mm. it actually excluded the external assessment system. Okay. That is why I was saying the last time that when we had the education sector review meeting, I thought it was a golden opportunity for stakeholders to discuss the issues of examination fraud. Mm. Unfortunately, apart from the fact that we were not even invited to participate in the process, mm. it wasn't even an issue. Mm. And I, I was very sad. That's it. Because I thought happen. that we missed an opportunity mm. to engage all, all the stakeholders in the sector, mm. the big, big, big boys, quote unquote, yeah. converge at one place yeah. for a week to, to think to, about solutions to, you know, Pressing issues in the sector. Mm, and, 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 and people and, didn't and, see and, that. And the nation fraud did not qualify to be uh, an issue. I was very, very sad. Mm, mm. If, if we were there, mm. that issue would have been discussed by force. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm sure that this is a topic that we will keep discussing until, exactly. because I'm sure in the next examination, we want to see some improvements. After all these reports, submission and discussions around it, we want to see improvement. Exactly. If it doesn't happen, we'll keep talking until it happens. But we also uh, hope that Africa Education Watch and the other stakeholders will put the needed pressure on the Ministry of Education to resolve exactly. this we'll issue. Do. But let me quickly Thank indicate so that mm. WIAC is not doing everything wrong. Okay. 45% of the questions we monitored did not leak. Okay. There were circulations, we mm. paid for them, mm. but the questions we got did not appear. Okay. It means that if WIAC wants to work, they can work. They can work. When the faces leaked, mm. they postponed the paper. Okay. When they wrote it again, it mm. never leaked. So it all, it's all about the willpower exactly. to do it. Exactly. So I think it's something that we'll keep discussing. I'm grateful so much, uh, Kofi Asari. He is Executive Director of Africa Education Watch. Thanks so much for coming Thank to you for the, the studio. Let's take a break on the post. Remember, you can join by all our social media handles on Joy News on TV. You can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. And my personal handle is at Danana Aisha. We are back in a GV. Welcome back to the polls. Let's move to Parliament, where the controversy over MP Francis Susu's tussle with the police seem to have divided the House as the majority and minority sides take hardline party stands on the matter. Mr. Susu has been declared wanted by police, but have refused to hand himself in. He's backed by the Speaker's office, which has argued the MP is performing parliamentary business. But as the controversy rages, MPs are now taking sides on the matter. Let's take you live now to Parliament and speak to correspondent Kwesi Parker Wilson. Uh, Parker, what has been uh, the stance of both sides? Well, so let's start with the majority because they uh, just joined the fray. And with the latest development, they are uh, in the words of the minority, attacking the speaker and undermining the powers of the speaker. Well, this morning, the majority issued a statement indicating that it is troubling for the speaker to refuse to release the member of parliament for Medina constituency to assist the police in investigation. And again, proceed that to accuse the speaker of undermining the rule of law. In fact, I'm going to quote to you a portion of the statement, and it's the concluding part which says that, and this is coming from the majority caucus, we take a firm view that in, in the particular case under reference, Parliament as a lawmaking arm of our democracy has a constitutional and legal and moral duty to cooperate and collaborate with the police to ensure that the rule of law prevails. Further, Parliament must not be seen to be creating a false regime of two separate laws in Ghana, one for MPs and another for non-MPs. Instead, Parliament must ensure the equality of all citizens, including MPs, before the law. So this is the statement that got to the minority caucus in sense. And for the minority, they believe that since last week when the speaker issued the statement, the majority side never mentioned a word about it. In fact, some of the majority members have endorsed the speaker's position. So it's shocking that today, the majority caucus will take a U-turn 
And the allegation is that perhaps the executive arm of government is manipulating the NPP NPs in parliament to depart from the speaker's position on this matter. And they find that very worrying. Again, they self notice that they have picked up information that the Akofado led government is using the police to intimidate NDC members of parliament. And they are saying that they are going to resist that if that is the case. And this is actually from uh, the member of parliament for Tamale Central, uh, Mutala Mohammed, when I spoke to him. Now, there was a different twist to it when parliament commenced business for the day and the deputy majority, Ibrahim Ahmed, raised the concern on that floor. Apparently, the two leaders of the House, the NPP and the NDC, had met over this issue and have agreed that they won't make any further pronouncement to the, 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 the conversation going on, but rather wait for the Speaker of Parliament himself, Alban Babin, to return to Ghana so that they can take a definite position on what is happening. It is shocking and surprising that shortly after they left the meeting, they picked up a copy of the statement which is in my possession and asked the majority side of the House to provide further clarity as to why they would betray the minority in this. Well, the deputy majority leader, uh, Afanya Makin, when he was responding to the claim, indicated that the statement was issued before the state meeting. And so, uh, he's asking his side of the house, that is the ma majority, and also the NDC MPs, to equally remain silent on this matter. He cautioned them against granting even interviews to the media and wait for the speaker to return. And when the speaker returns, the leadership of the house, that is Jose Chairman Sabonsu, the minority leader, Harun Adusi, and the others will now take a decision on the way forward because they need to fashion out modalities on how parliament is going to cooperate with the police going forward. Uh, they know that obviously members of parliament would have issues with the law. And so when some of these issues come up, what is the way forward? How then do we deal with it? So for now, the members of the House say, from, from both sides say, they will remain silent on the issue until the leadership of the House return to Ghana to take a decision on the matter. But it's obvious that parliament is sharply divided over this. And Asha, if you recall, when the Medina MP himself raised this matter on the floor of the House, the deputy majority leader, Alexander Feimakin, attempted to arrest the motion and raise concerns about whether he has followed the processes to, 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 to file the complaint or the contempt charge against the two top police officer. And the speaker was clear that this is a matter for members of parliament and it's not a matter for the MPP or the NDC. It's an attack on parliament as a whole and he expects every member of the House to support the cause and ensure that there is no breach of parliament or no individual um, insults the integrity of parliament. So this has been the position of the speaker, which today we are learning that the NPP departed from. Uh, how about the MP himself? Have you, did you see him in parliament today? I'm talking about the Medina MP. So, Aisha, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, today being Thursday, the member of parliament for Medina constituency hasn't been in the house. In fact, in the chamber to be precise. I do not know whether he's been to his office or not, but in the chamber to conduct parliamentary business, the MP hasn't been seen. His seat remained vacant in the last three days. If I let me add that the deputy majority leader, Alexander Feyemakin, when he was responding to the concerns raised, indicated to the MP that he should feel free and come to the chamber and prosecute what he's been mandated to do by his constituent. And so there's no need for him to be hiding. That is, if indeed he is, but he should come to parliament. Of course, parliament is going to protect him and come and uh, 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 um, join the, the parliamentary business. I have checked with his own colleagues on the NDC side. The reason given to me for his absence is that perhaps he might be engaged in committee work. And that is why the member of parliament for Medina is not in the chamber. So the fact that he's not in the chamber does not mean or constitute an absence in parliament, but rather 
engage in other parliamentary duties outside the chamber. So that has been the explanation given to me by his colleagues on the NPP side. Parker, what else has been happening in parliament? Well, so today the interior minister, Ambrose Derry, appeared before the house to answer specific questions regarding um, issues of armed robbery and issues of criminal activities within specific constituencies. Well, in general, uh, he indicated to the house that the security agencies or the ministry has built that security to ensure they foster criminal activities or activities related to crime in the country. And so it is not necessarily within the uh, uh, the, the, the WA uh, uh, constituency. In fact, this is actually coming from the WA West MP who actually asked the question. So the minister indicated that it is not just about the WA municipality, but of course, Ghana in general or the country in general, there are steps being taken to ensure that they reduce crime drastically. And of course, with the inception of the new IGP, uh, Parliament should be assured that he's ready to deal with nefarious activities by any individual irrespective of of your position or your status in in life again there has been the conversation of the esla uh, the the minority has been raising some concerns about the expenditure and some of the monies and how government has handled it the conversation is still going on on the floor and i'm sure that at the end of the day uh, parliament to take a resolution on the matter and this is actually coming uh, from the annual report of the the, the ministry of energy so parliament is currently looking at that when they are done i'm sure a resolution will be taken on that Parker wilson he's in parliament for us and he's been telling us about happenings in that house We'll still monitor events there and there is updates for you in our subsequent bulletins. But Finance Minister Ken Ufuriata will be in Parliament on Wednesday, November 17, to present the government's economic policy and budget statement for the 2022 fiscal year. His focus will be to deal with the high government expenditure on salaries and interest payments, which takes more than 53% of government's expenditure. The budget deficit, however, is expected to widen from 38 billion to 20 uh, in 2021 to close to 40 billion Ghana cities in 2022. Well, we'll be talking about how organized labor see this whole thing. But let's look at um, how the 2020 budget will be looking when the finance minister goes to parliament. So the, the budget will actually focus on revitalization, uh, transforming the economy through digitization, industrialization, competitive import substitution, export expansion, and the creation of decent jobs, particularly for the youth. Now, look at how the projected revenue is looking versus the expenditure. And remember, there's been talks about the high government expenditure, which needs to be cut down if we need to work on our economy. So the projected expenditure is uh, 128.3 billion, okay? Uh, that is what will happen in the 2022 budget. Projected revenue at 89.1 billion Ghana cities, and the deficit will be at 39.2 uh, billion cities. Now, if you look at a comparative analysis of 2021 and 2022 budgets, you will see that in 2021, uh, it stood at what? 113.8 billion that was the expenditure for 2021 if you look at 2022 it is projected to go up to 128.3 billion cities for the 2022 year and then that was expenditure for you now look at revenue 2021 and 2022 and you have for 2021 revenue was generated uh, at 72.5 billion cities now, 2022 is projected to generate 89.1 billion cities. And the question is, will the revenue match the expenditure? Now, if you look at the interest payments and compensation of employees, uh, those are the projected amounts to be spent on these two areas. And you can see 37.1 billion cities representing 27.9% of the total expenditure. That's why I asked the question whether expenditure and revenue is matching. Now you're seeing that 27.9% of the uh, revenue that will be generated 
interest payments only will take 27.9% of the total expenditure. Now, if you look at the compensation of employees, it will take 35.9 billion cities, which stands at 28.9% of the total expenditure. So the projected amount to be spent actually on interest payments and compensation alone will represent 91% of what government seeks to raise as revenue in 2022. And this is where... Uh, the uh, conversation is hanging around. That is where the argument has been. Now, organized labor says it is looking ahead to uh, the budget as well, but have warned that government to look elsewhere for solutions because they say they don't really care about expenditure and revenue and what have you. They still want more. Listen to Angel Carbono, who is president of NAGRAT, one of the groups demanding more pay. The government should identify where the money that culminated in the deficit go. Certainly, that amount of money cannot be said to come to uh, emolument, salaries and compensation of workers. Absolutely not. Because I can tell you that over 80% of public sector workers in Ghana receive less than 1,500 Ghana cities a month. 1,500 cities a month. Something you, we all know is woefully inadequate and very unacceptable. So it certainly is not on salaries and emolument. It is going elsewhere that ought to be blocked, a loophole that ought to be blocked. Well, you, you seem to be saying that the politicians are spending the money elsewhere or on themselves. Uh, what exactly is it that you know? Well, look at the spending? salary of Article 71 office holders. Look at their salaries, look at their allowances, look at their pay. What about it? Is it too high? Well, for in relation to what the other public sector workers earn, it is very high. Some other ventures, when, when you go around this country, projects are littered all over the country. That is turned into white elephants. These are some of the places where the shortages come from. So two things, the projects that have not been completed and are therefore not in use, and then compensation to the president and his appointees. Yes. Would you say they have to cut their salaries to make up for the deficit? Well, they should trim the numbers in the first place. When you look at the number of people employed in the presidency, when you look at the number of people hanging on as political appointed, uh, appointees, when you look at uh, money spent at political party functions, all these monies fall within the general Ghana uh, KT money. The money is not coming from elsewhere. It's uh, also part of Ghana uh, money. Uh, how Projects you, uh, that are engaged in to satisfy uh, people not because of its economic value. So uh, the fighting of uh, housing schemes littered all over this country when workers are looking for places to lay their heads, those housing schemes have not been completed, and then we are losing money on a daily basis. But how do you add expenditure on political party activities to government Let me expenditure? Tell you, have you realized the interesting thing that the party program of the political party in power surges up when they are in power and looks very, very popularized when they are in opposition? Where do you think all those monies are coming from? Uh, tell me. Those monies are all coming from the state. How come the same amount of money is not mobilized when the party is in opposition? You are effectively saying they are siphoning state funds to satisfy their political party uh, needs. That is my highest suspicion. Our salaries are woefully inadequate. And if the compensation is to reduce the deficit, Salaries and compensation should not be one of the factors to look at because salaries and compensations are already very low in this country. Well, this afternoon we're focusing on how government can resolve the deficit dilemma. And joining me for this conversation via Zoom is Professor Lord Mensah. He's an associate professor with the Department of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Lagon. Uh, Prof, I'm grateful for your time. This is not the first time we're expressing worry over government's high expenditure. Now we're being told that the budget deficit will uh, now jump from $38 billion 
to 40 billion cities. How should we take this news, first of all? Yeah, um, if you look at uh, uh, last year's uh, budget, I mean, clearly, you could see that the government's um, appetite for borrowing um, keeps on growing every now and then. And uh, obviously, if you create a huge budget deficit, you may have to finance it. And the problem with our, our budget is that with the expenditure side that we have control, we are not able to manage it very well. Because um, I, I split the expenditure side into two, which we have the discretionary and then the non-discretionary expenditure, you know, um, lines. And the discretionary ones, I think we should be able to control these ones. The ones that are non-discretionary, like the interest payment and salary, it's non-negotiable. Those ones, I think, um, when you project into the year and the realities are not that much different. But the ones that causes problem is the um, the, no, the, the, the non-discretionary ones. And those ones are ones that I think uh, we should be able to uh, find a way to control them. I'm sorry, the discretionary ones. Those, are, those ones are the ones that we should be able to control. And indeed, um, if you want to construct 10 kilometer road um, and you know you are tied up in terms of your um, debt levels and all those, you don't want to borrow more, you reduce it. And so for me, um, raising that kind of um, budget deficit sometimes calls for unnecessary hopes, which uh, normally we are not able to meet. And if you owe as a country, obviously that is not when you tend to be aggressive. Because if you increase your budget deficit, um, it means that you are adapting that aggressive posture in economic management. And, you know, aggressive posture in economic management, you only take that when you foresee a future growth, when you foresee a serious economic expansion. But that is not the case at this time. Uh, we just came out from COVID. And trust me, uh, globally, every country is now picking up in terms of business activities. So if you come out with a huge budget deficit, then I don't know the kind of um, um, economic management you intend to um, um, go into in the next uh, coming year. So for me, um, uh, it's a good signal. I mean, it's about time the government pulled down on the aggressive you know, posture that they've been posing all these years. Let's come to the reality and see um, exactly what is happening. I mean, everybody that owes, if you come to your own home, and if you owe, that is not when you start um, build, putting up more buildings. You rather tone down some of these expenditures and then ensure that um, the basics that can keep you afloat, uh, you keep them going until things get better. But as it stands now, that is not what we see in the current uh, management. Now, um, the people who say that this adjustment is not something that would come easy for government to actually adapt or take. But for you, what should be the strategy in bridging the gap? So, because the, the argument now is, is between borrowing and cutting down expenditure. How can government actually put itself in this shoe and decide to cut expenditure like you're suggesting? Well, uh, you see, I've been drumming on this expenditure cut for some years now. And uh, I realized that it, politically, it may not be wise to do that. But economically, it would be wise. Because if you're going to borrow and you're going to borrow at a higher interest rate, remember, the approach of the United States, which serves as you know, a safe haven for investment, uh, they're now going to the tight, the tight monetary policy trajectory, where they're going to increase you know, their rate. And by so doing, any investor that is, you know, that intends to invest in a sovereign bond would like to invest in the U.S. market. Remember, even in a local market, the market is dominated by foreign. So effectively, they will tend to look at the United States market uh, more better, which is a more or less uh, a secure market compared to our market. So borrowing in, in that regard is going to attract more interest or more coupon payment to the investor. And looking at our economic indicators, which has not been, you know, favorable all these uh, um, years, um, obviously the, the, the investor will not have that confidence to send money here at a lower cost. So, and so the best you can do, which you have control over, is to reduce your expenditure. And as I said, 
the expenditure we have, ones that you have control over, and the ones that you don't have control over. If you take expenditure lines like cap capital expenditure, goods and services, grant to other agencies and all those, these are some things that you can easily you know, look into and then pluck in some leakages. And over uh, that side of expenditure, I would have loved to spend only when, let me emphasize on this, only when you know that expenditure is able to generate direct revenue. That is when I will put in something. But if the expenditure will not likely to generate you know, direct revenue, let me put it one to one, I, will, I may not put in money in that direction. So that would be where we rationalize our expenditure in that case. And effectively, that should be able to help us one way or the other. Until things get better, we cannot continue to position ourselves aggressively as if we have a very good future, therefore let's spend into it. That is not the case. Mm. Professor Lord Mensah, I'm extremely grateful for your time this afternoon. He's an associate professor of finance at the uh, University uh, Business School, uh, University of Ghana Business School. Now, students and authorities of Sugakopit Senior High School say they are determined to be the first school from the Volta and Oti regions to win the National Science and Maths Quiz Trophy. No school from the two regions has won the NSMQ title since its inception more than 20 years ago. Kitsa Senior High technical school has always been the touch bearer for the regions but has falling short where it matters most winning the ultimate prize maxwell agbagba interacted with teachers and students of sogasco ahead of their contest with malco girls and saint paul's shs <laughs> The contest itself has not started yet, but these ladies and gentlemen from Sogakopa Senior High School um, are promising that they're going to win that particular contest. They're going to win the contest against EPC Maoko Girls and St. Paul Senior High School. Now, um, for many years, or since the inception of the National Science and Math Quiz, no school from the Volta region has ever won the NSMQ trophy. Sogakopa Senior High School it's promising that this year for the Volta region and the guys are so confident this is how they arrived here at the grounds at the Nat Hall. Let's speak to them and find out from them why they are so confident of lifting the 2021 trophy. We, are, we come here with Vim and we are going to win with Vim because destiny, destiny is our prosperity, nothing else. We are going to win. Education is an ornament to prosperity and a refuge to adversity. And learning to learn is a kind of learner we all need to acquire. So we are here to learn and to win. Are you a philosopher? Oh, I'm trying to be a philosopher and it's my dream, it's my ambition to be a philosopher. Thanks so much for talking to us. Yeah, we are expecting nothing but the best. Nothing but we've come here all prepared. We are not undermining any school. No school is too small. So because of that, we've come here all prepared for anything that is going to come our way. And we are beating them hands down. We have a great confidence that we, are, we can win this year. My name is Daniel Dogambela. Okay, and you are? I'm the coordinator for St. Mary's Seminary Secondary School. That is what we are, all the coordinators are planning. That at least this year, Volta Regis School is going to go for the finals and we are going to make it. So that is our wish. Does it worry you that no school from the Volta region has ever won the national It has been very disturbing. So we the coordinators have come together to strategize so that at least this year a school from the Volta region is bringing the cup back. Yes, bringing it. There is going to be a competition. That one, we are not leaving it out. There is going to be a competition. Okay. But what we are trying to do is, we are rallying behind every voter region school. For example, exactly. our school will be having contests tomorrow. Yeah. But I'm here to support all schools. Exactly what I said. Yeah. So that is a strategy. Okay. So there is going to be a competition. Okay. But we are going to be behind any school okay. that wins to the one eight one four semi-finals to the finals. My name is Alex Akote, the assistant headmaster, Sugakopa Senior High School. Yeah, we are expecting the very best. It is very true that no school in Volta region has ever reached the final. But we are improving upon our performance day after day. We have reached uh, one eighth stage before. 
So this time we are hoping to pass that stage. Yeah, it's a worry to us. So as a school, we are investing in our students. We calm them even during the holidays for them to have extra, extra tuition. So as you, as you are saying, they know the contestants. They know their word, what they are capable of doing. So we are hoping that God be on our side who will move a step ahead. It will mean glory. Everybody wants the very best. So when we are able to lift up the trophy, then we will also be counted among the committee of schools in the country. <laughs> Remember the 2021 National Science and Maths Quiz is produced by Prime Time Limited and sponsored by the Ghana Education Service in partnership with APSA Ghana. The broadcast of the National Science and Maths Quiz on Joy News is supported by Carl Bell, Papa's Pizza, Ace Medical Insurance, Tampico, DBS Industries Limited and Dole Yogurt. Let's take a break on the polls. When we return, there's a very latest coming from the world of sports. Thanks for joining me uh, for Sport on the Pulse. I'm Hans Mensah and the Black Stars head coach Milovan Raivach has named teenager Felix Afenajan in his 20-man, 28-man squad for this month's World Cup Qatar 2022 Group G qualifiers against Ethiopia and South Africa. The 18-year-old who made his senior debut for AS Roma against Hagliari last month has been handed a maiden call-up by the Serbian trainer. He's joined by Sheriff Tiraspol midfielder Edmond Ado who's been impressive in the ongoing UEFA Champions League and the Moldovan League. Let's check out the full complement of the squad, the 28 players who have been called up for those two assignments. So, goalkeeper Joseph Wolakot still in the team. He plays for Swindon Town. Lawrence Satizigi is with St. Gallen in, in Switzerland. Manav Nurudin plays for UPenn. Richard Atta of Accra Hato Folk are the four goalkeepers who have been called up. In defence, uh, Milovan Raivash has called up uh, Andy Yadom of Red FC. Philemon Bafo um, still remains in the team. Plays for Dreams FC. Baba Abdul Rahman is with Red FC. Gideon Mensah plays for Bordeaux. Daniel Amate is with Leicester City. Alexander Jiku of Strasbourg. There is Celta Vigos, Joseph Edu and uh, Columbus Crew. Um, skipper Jonathan Mensah also in there as well as Asante Koroko. Centre-back Ismail Abdul Ghani. In midfield, Baba Idrisu of Real Mallorca, Thomas Partey of Arsenal, Mubarak Wakasu makes a return to the team. He's with Shenzhen FC, Edmond Adu of Sheruti Aspol, and Mohamed Kudus of Ajax as well as Daniel Kofitre of FC St. Pauli in the German lower leagues. The strikers are Richmond Boachi Yadom of Beta Jerusalem in Israel, makes a return to the team. Benjamin Tete of Yeni. Um, Malatias Paul, there is Felix Afenajan of AS Roma and Caleb Ekuban of Genoa. The wingers are Andre Ayu of Al Saad, Jordan Ayu of Crystal Palace, Abdul Fatal Isahaku of Dreams FC, Kamal Din Suleimana of Rene, and um, Samuel Owusu of Al Fire. So those are the players who have been called up for the, these um, all-important assignments for the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers. So Rick Wampoff joins me in studio with perspective and analysis. Any name in there that surprises you, Rico? Well, I think, yeah, we have to understand that call-ups would always... There's never a right call-up yeah. and there would always be question marks. You just want to limit it as much as possible. First off, I'm impressed with the retention rates. Uh, okay. start, the currency stands at 75 percent we are seeing 24 of the previous 32 still present so it shows that Milo at least has identified his core as However, a measure of consistency yeah probably more than we saw in the CK corner okay. and uh, that's a good point however I think names uh, such as uh, Philemon Bafo has left a lot of Ghanaians talking <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is, is his, sixth, his sixth call up mm. uh, since 2020 
and uh, that's the second highest any player has received. And so you would expect that he would be that type of tier because essentially what you're trying to say is that you depend on him. And so you've called him the second highest is that, in the past is, year. Is that possibly something that, I mean, yes, we're giving CK Akono the stick for calling Philemon Balfour. Milovan Rivas has come and is still calling him. Is it something that you've seen that perhaps we monitoring the Ghana Premier League are not seeing? No, there's, there's nothing that he's seen. And I say this because in the last match, he called Philemon and then Andy Adam. Andy Adam was hit, and Melo himself was left to one right back and ended up playing Daniel Amate, who is a centre back as a right back in both matches. And so, if you could even trust Philemon to give him two minutes, Fatou Mohamed came in his debut call up and he played ahead of uh, Philemon Bafo. Fatou, who had never played national team football. And then you look at Amate, who barely plays as a right back nowadays being played as a right back, all, all ahead of Philemon, it just tells you that the guy is probably not deemed good enough. And so the question is, is there a case that he is only good enough to be called, uh, but not good enough to be played? Uh, that would be strange because, I mean, you don't call people just to occupy spaces. You call people because you think they are the best 28 players that Ghana can put But all up. 28 will not play, even if Philemon Balfour is not called. Yeah, Another but, player is called in his place. All 28 players will not be playing. But the idea is that you want to have players who can slot in because you're anticipating anything could happen. Mm. You know, it's COVID times. Anything, your player could test positive hours before a game and someone has to slot in. Mm. Someone can pick an injury in training. But the whole idea of calling 28 is that you want to give yourself that cushion that if anyone is absent from the starting 11, mm. at least... You trust that the replacement and, and that, is close and that to question being good has enough. been answered when Daniel Amati was made to play at right back in the absence of Andy Yadon. Yeah. Okay. There is also the, the small matter of Felix Afinajan who has been called up. A whole debate around it. Some feel that um, you know the boy should be allowed to establish himself properly at, at AS Roma. Seventy seven minutes of senior football, some do not think is enough for him to be in a call up into the Black Stars. Well, let's start off with uh, Melovan, the man who called him. He says that he believes the kid is ready. And he showed it through his development that he doesn't need so much time. And if a coach such as Jose Moreno, who demands a lot, is, has put his faith, um, his faith in the boy, then it shows that he, he is good enough. And from what he's seen, he thinks he's ready for the national team football. Well, there's always the outlier case, the, the kid who pops up and doesn't follow the usual trajectory Absolutely. of development. Yeah. And you should understand that every player, there's no one way to development for a player. Mm. So... I mean, I understand where both parties are coming from. And you would want to give him the opportunity and let him know that he is a big player and mm. we are going to heavily rely on him from the onset. And uh, there's also the school of thought that it might be too early for him. So I, I understand where both parties are coming from, but I, I think I side with Roma. Okay. And mm. they are saying that they don't want to release the player because they feel it's too early in his development. Uh, and, 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 and of course, quick one, are we looking at a potential starter in Afinaja? Can he come in and just slot in as a, as a main striker for the Black Stars? Well, I look at the strikers, Benjamin Tete, I don't think he did enough to warrant a starting spot. Mm. We've brought in Boachi Adam, just two goals in Israel in eight games, not impressive for me. Uh, I look through that list and I'm struggling to see any real striker who you can say that this guy is going to start all games for Ghana. So there is an open chance for him. And I think that's what Milo might be considering. And uh, you can look at uh, Kubantu has been struggling for goals in Genoa. Well, we'll see. Um, as to whether he'll be able to grab this opportunity, Felix Afinajan of AS Roma, trusted by Jose Mourinho. 77 minutes of senior football for Roma, yet to score bad. Milo Vamarai Vak thinks that the boy is ready. You know what they say. Um, if he's good enough, you know, it's, there's no problem with it. You know, he has to be able to play. And so the man has been caught up. We'll keep bringing you up to speed on matters related to the Black Star. Of course, you can read the very latest at myjoyonline.com forward slash sports. Oreku, thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Hans Mengsando. And that's how we wrap up The Pulse this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. I've indeed enjoyed my almost two hours stay with you. Up next is Let's Talk Showbiz, but also log on to myjohnline.com. You'll get more of our stories and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. <laughs>